We are live. Hello and welcome to the first Fiction Authors Roundtable. Um, you're going to have to bear with me, our listeners, because this is the first time I've, I'm doing a live stream with multiple guests simultaneously. So if I screw up, have a heart. Um, we are hopefully we're going to get Ann Sturzinger joining us. She uh, was ill and I believe she will be popping in later. But I'm going to just start out by introducing uh, everyone on the dais here. First up, we have Andy Nowicki, a YouTuber, podcaster, and author of uh, several novels. Uh, some of them are Under the Night Hill, Columbine Pil Pilgrim, Heart Killer, and several others. And he also, of course, uh, blogs extensively and uh, has a podcast. And you can go to his YouTube. Links are in the description, guys. Links are in the description. Uh, Ann Sturzinger, like I said, hopefully she'll be joining us. She is uh, an editor, translator, and author of several books, including Girl Detective, No Scrim, The Talkative Corpse, The Steam Vendetta, and Life. Um, she has also translated a French work, In the Sky, by Octave Mer Merbeau, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, next up, we got Vince LaRosa, a.k.a. Dennis Malone. Vince is author of Tesla and Malone, Lightning's Call. Uh, Vince, uh, he also uh, writes on his website, uh, see description, and he is co-founder and co-creator of Legends of the Tabletop, uh, all about RPGs and tabletop gaming. As Again, link in the description. And last but certainly not least, we have our only millennial in the group here, TJ Martinell. Um, he is... Uh, is the youngest man on this virtual dais that we have. Uh, he is a blogger and author of Men Who Walk Alone, The Stringers, and its sequel, The Informers. He also has several short stories that have been just published by TerraHouseMag.com. He is an avid hiker and writes and podcasts about that on his website and SoundCloud. Again, links in the description. So that is, uh, that is all for the intros. Um, oh, Anne, you're here. Yeah. Yeah. You made I, uh, yeah. Being, I, true, uh, being true to your gender, huh? <laughs> I crawled up out of the swamp. I'm so freaking sick. I've been sick all week, but I made it. I uh, am... Thank you. Thank you for doing this one. I know, I know you haven't been feeling well because you did say that you were not well the other day. And we really appreciate you uh, doing this in uh, that condition you're in. But hopefully, hopefully this will make you feel better. Get your mind off of it. Yeah. Maybe being around all this testosterone will help you out. I think you got an estrogen imbalance going on there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's true. I'll, I'll, if I go silent for a while, I might just be throwing up. So. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Well, um, let us hear it if you are. All right. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. We want to keep this. We, it's all about the reality, and so. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, my first uh, question uh, is well, I mean, my first victim, I guess, is going to be Andy. Um, yeah. So I, I, my, my first question goes to him. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about what to ask, you know, authors and all the, you know, like, there's all these generic things you could ask, you know, well, what was your inspiration and what this and that? And don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with those questions. And, and we will ask some of those kind of generic questions as well. But I thought I'd kind of come up with a, what I thought would be a bit of a zinger. And uh, by the way, the rest of you guys are probably are going to get asked this too. But Andy's like kind of on the spot here. Yeah. Here's the question. Uh, what is the one question as a novelist you wish that someone would ask you? Um, boy, you really are putting me on the spot. <laughs> no pressure, Andy. It's not like other people listening. <laughs> I have to I have to come up some, with something really clever right now. Um, uh, <laughs> but no pressure at all. I would say just like... Uh, uh, where do I, where can I buy your books? <laughs> that was great. That was great. You did it. You did it. Sweet. All right. I love it. All right. Same to you, Anne. Same question. Uh, why do you fucking bother? Why do I, oh, 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 okay. And then what yeah, would you answer? Consider, that? Considering the literacy rates, um, I would have to say, because I'm still living in 1995, Oh, yeah, Anne is forever stuck in uh, the ironic stage of Gen Xers back in the 90s. Uh, <laughs> no, I think I, she still listens to Alanis Morissette, if I'm, I could be wrong about that. Oh, 
fuck you, man. I never really know that. She can drown in my cunt hairs. Well, you can actually drown in hair, but wow, I'm really not feeling well. <laughs> this is going to be entertaining. One Let Hand in Pocket is, is not a bad song, actually, I have to say. Well, the, 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 one, the one about the, the, the guy, that's about me, you know, the guy that left her. <laughs> Um, okay, next up, Vince. Same question, buddy. Um, I would go with what I was thinking. What Andy was saying, it's like, hey, where can I find your book, your book, and your your future books? Um, but for the most part, I <laughs> how can I make you rich? Exactly. <laughs> Fund- fundamentally, I just people just need to leave us alone to write. And basically, I don't want I don't want any questions really. <laughs> uh, you, you do realize there, Vince, that you know we're we're talking to uh, uh, potential uh, new readers here, so yes. you know. All right, readers. Uh, readers need to read, so us writers can write. And you buy our books. You like them or you don't. You comment about them or you don't. You help us out either way. And then you go about your business, and we do our business of writing. Okay, well, that's You're just kind of what's happening now. Exactly. exactly. Now, actually, in order to really be left alone to write, someone would have to be my patron of the arts and just give me a million dollars so I don't have to do a day job all the time. There you go. Time. How can you make me rich? There you go. Well, or that you could just become one of those cam models, and I talked to you about that before. Um, <laughs> the, that uh, uh, but I'm, I think, still, I think I'm still toying with that idea myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, last up, TJ, and you better come up with a good one because you had the most time to think about it. <laughs> well, I'm assuming uh, if it's a reader who's already read my book um, and is asking about it, I would want them to ask me, how did you come up with so-and-so, either a character or a plot or uh, the, the concept? Because that shows that I actually wrote something that was worth reading. Uh, if they haven't read it, I would go with the previous a- answers where, where can I get your books? Or, um, you know, how can I, how can I donate... Uh, to, to the cause, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, I think the question that deep down we all really wish someone would ask us is, why are you such a genius? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Fair I get that question asked to me about a lot. You know, how, how is it this way? I mean, well, we, we, we know the answer to that question. I mean, we would just have to say, I don't know. It's just, it's just we just uh, drew the uh, you know, the uh, the lucky hand in the the game of life. We got the genius hand. Yeah, the genetic lottery. With great, with resp- <laughs> great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> but would you rather think that people think you're a genius because you just drew the lucky hand, or because you used so much elbow grease that now you're a genius? Right, because I work really, really hard to become a genius. Yeah, that's what. It, that's what I would have to say. Uh, that actually, um, this wouldn't be a question maybe from a reader, but I have gotten this often: is um, what do you, what does it take to be a writer? Or what do you have to do to get to a certain point where you're able to write um, a certain way? And Because I think that there's this misconception that people just have a natural ability to write and they don't have to do any work or have any discipline. You in- stole my question, buddy. Oh. <laughs> no, well, I didn't have to that way. Here was the question I had. Um, and it's for all of you, so everyone to jump in. But the question was, are writers born or are they made? Maybe a little of both. Yeah, I... Uh, I- when I was like, I don't even remember learning how to read. My parents say I taught myself to read when I was like two and a half or three years old. And the I do remember figuring out that like, I just thought books like floated down from the gods. I thought they were the, these magical things. And when I finally got old enough to realize that people wrote books, that's all I wanted to do. But from there to actually being able to write one, it's definitely made. So you're born wanting to make yourself one? Oh, I think I can add to that. I mean, because I had a similar thing going on when I was younger. Um, I, I was an avid reader as a kid. You know, I read the Hardy Boys and the Three Investigators and other kind of things that boys read, uh, oh, wow. read too, huh? back, in, back in the early 80s. Um, and... Uh, there would, uh, you know, there would always be these lists of like other books by the author, and you know, a list of, of books, and so I actually made some of those for myself. I thought, you know, <laughs> also by Andy Nowicki, and then I made up a, a list of titles. I just thought, you know, I thought it would just be so cool to have, you know, have a page like that, and then have all these titles uh, attributed to me. And I didn't even think what 
you know, I just came up with, with some of them were cool titles. Some of them were just sort of generic titles, but I just like, yeah, here's a list of books by me. Um, yeah, by the way, one of uh, the titles of one of Andy's books is Considering Suicide. I mean, for Christ's sake, what a title. <laughs> was that on your list in kindergarten, Andy? That was, not, that was not on my list. As a, that was, as if I was your parents old. and I saw that list that Andy made, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> but, no, uh, none of the books that I've actually published have, have were, were on the list of possible books by me uh, when I when I made those lists as a kid. So I've still got a... I've still got to write. The, I've got to remember what find those lists again, and then write those books. I've got that. Yeah, the to be one, the, the one about how I kill everybody and then me. That one is. <laughs> <your last> <laughs> one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I'm not picking on Andy, but he, he he's the. I think he's he sold more books than anyone else here, so I think he can, uh, he can mm. take a little bit. Oh, but Andy, mm. that question about born or made. You, uh, I don't know if you still do, but you taught writing or some sort of creative writing kind of class. Yeah, I taught composition for for a while. Um, yeah, it wasn't really a creative writing class. It was just sort of, um, freshman level composition, but, but I mean, it, it does bring up the same kind of issues. Like, you know, there are certain people who, uh, who are driven to write and others who aren't. And it's, it's, it's uh, pretty tough to try to, you know, get people who aren't driven to write to, you know, to write for a grade, um, some, yeah. that, that's enough of an incentive for some of them, but for others, it's not really so. It's kind of a weird personality because you you have to be you have to have enough delusions of grandeur to think that you actually might be able to someday if you work hard enough write a novel that's worth reading. But if you have that kind of delusion of grandeur, you're more likely to put it into like trying to become a movie star or a politician or something. You know, like something. Well, something now, more nowadays, yeah. Be because the, the uh, authors don't, there's not as much prestige, I don't think, with authors as there used to be. Um, you guys could probably speak to that more. Yeah, it's kind of up there with being a dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a little higher on the elevator. I, th I think the problem is, is that not that technology has been a bad thing, but one of the consequences of the internet and everything that we have now is that anybody can be a writer or can claim to be a writer. So. It, and because it's right, fiction is subjective to an extent. How do you determine somebody who is an actual writer versus a, a just somebody who threw stuff on paper? Kind of like how you see everybody's an amateur photographer now, or yeah, photographer. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody, because everybody has a camera now, and so it's not like math or science where you either it's either right or it's not. Um, it, the writing world's a little bit different from that. So when you tell people you're a writer, they think, well, what does that mean? Does that mean you just wrote something and then just published it on Kindle you know, online and, and all that? I'm a writer. I have a blog about my kids and nail polish. <laughs> and they take, they take 200 pictures of, of what they're eating for breakfast. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's kind of um, tight. So it's not just, but it's not just uh, anyone can be a writer now. Anyone can do a lot of things. Anyone can be like their own little, you know, musician or rock star and make, you know, make a video of that, you know. Right. Um, do you remember, I don't know if it was several years ago, for example, that was uh, this teenage girl and her parents like hired a company to make a music video of some cheesy song, song called like Friday, Friday or something oh, like that. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Absolutely. it went like viral and she, you know, I mean, that YouTube video guy, but I mean, it was, it was supposed to be people liking it because it was ironic or something and you know whatever but i mean it was just like money can buy that now i remember um i saw an interview years ago with simon cowell you know the, that real english asshole from like uh, uh the talent show um and him saying something that celebrityism and fame has actually become a disease of society i don't know though i would say is it is it really a bad thing to to uh uh, that, that we have all these different outlets today. And that, I mean, I think, I think that's actually a way of breaking through this kind of, you know, you've got to go, th you've got to go through the proper channels to become a, uh, what we determine to be an author. And if you don't succeed at going through these proper channels, then you, uh, you're not really an author or you're well, not really a this, or you're not really a that. I they're mean, both I think, kind of terrible. Like the, the old gate, as I recall, the old gatekeepers were terrible and ran on nepotism and bullshit. But now there's this huge flood of shit, and what floats to the top is the lowest common denominator. So both systems are garbage, essentially. 
Yeah, and you and I talked about this when I when I interviewed you one on one. By the way, anyone listening, um, you can find that in the archive of my channel. Um, talking about uh, tr the traditional way of getting published versus now um, you can self publish your books, and it's a lot easier. Uh, and I, I never published a, a book, but I, I, I assume it's you know it doesn't take a rocket scientist to go on Kindle. And I mean, the hard part is just writing the book. Publishing it is the easy part. Promoting right. it. But also, like from what, from my understanding, from just uh, the, the few authors I've talked to, and just from my readings, I understand that the traditional publishing route, getting published by a publishing house, is pretty much impossible. And if you do, they're not going to spend any money marketing your work because oh, yeah. they they have a few authors that they spend their marketing budget on, and everyone else is just I don't know charity work, and they don't spend any money to market it. Yeah, I mean, if, if you are independently wealthy enough to buy a shit ton of ads on Facebook, like, the, the you, you can buy ads and get your stuff public, publicity, but if you don't have that amount of capital, like, just the, the organic clicks that come in, it's a mystery to me how anyone gets them. Like, even, even you know, there's this, there's this perception that blogs are democratic, but... If, if, if you're not well connected and you don't have a lot of money for advertising, it's really hard to get that initial traction. So I don't know. It's easy to be, it's easy to be sentimental about the gatekeepers. It's also easy to shit on the gatekeepers, but I don't think we've really found a good system either way. So I think, um, I think it's better to have, uh, I think that the variety, even if they're both, even if there are disadvantages to both, I think, the, there, there is some. It is better to have uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, establishment gatekeepers and and a non-establishment, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, gatekeepers or whatever. Than than just to have a, the establishment be the only way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's something good that came of the internet in general. I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm a, a cyber optimist totally, but I mean, it's it's a way we've broken down this this whole corrupt system it's not necessarily being replaced by something better but at least it's being at least there's the possibility of replacing it with something better yeah i i am um, on your side on this argument andy because i wouldn't have been exposed to uh you guys if it wasn't for the self-publishing i wouldn't have read your works in all likelihood i wouldn't you know know about it so that I'm I'm in favor of this self-publishing thing. Yeah, there's a ton of crap out there, but I mean, the good stuff is is out there too. You just have to go, you know, might you just have to find it. But I mean, if you go to a book, I mean, you go to like a classic example was I used to have to fly a lot, and uh, you know the um, you know the little book stands they have in the airports. I don't know if you guys do much flying, and mm -hmm. they just have the paperbacks of the real big, you know, the the big names on there like Patterson or whatever, or um, you know, yeah, air, airplane. Uh, airplane reading. Yeah, and I mean, I, I remember being desperate a few times, you know, because I needed to I have to read when I'm flying, and and actually buying, uh, you know, Anne Rice for Christ's sake, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, who was who's just some like some crappy stuff, you know, because but um, I, you know, and it's it's just that just generic kind of stuff that's just pumped out over and over again. Um, so th that you know, I guess it's really good now that now you can you know you can have a Kindle or your phone or your your iPad or whatever it is, and you can, or your laptop or whatever, and you can just read all you want. You know, you can, um, and they have that Gutenberg project online where all the classics that are in the public domain, right. you can just download those. Those are great. Oh, I love those. Yeah, mm -hmm. isn't that great? All those books are free, you know? Yeah. Um, nah, I was just like in heaven with that. But um, here's a question I have Do you, uh, about, about uh, readers and are you guys avid readers or are you just more writers like you know reading other people's like i'm not saying like Anne, for example i know you have to read a lot for your job but are you someone who enjoys reading other people's fiction oh Absolutely. yeah i wish i had more time for it i mean I, I love doing it when i can do it it's but it's it's ironically if you have to have a day job and you're a writer time to actually read fiction is kind of a luxury uh, yeah, I imagine. Well, also, you kind of get burned out if your job involves so much reading, even if it's work reading. Yeah, not really. Oh, no? Okay. I don't, get, I don't get burned out. It's just a luxury to find the time. All right, Vince and TJ, what are your thoughts on that? 
Um, my thought is I <clears throat> am, I, I used to read a lot of books and I still try to do it now, but I think the difference is I'm diversifying my interests and, and trying to do new stuff. So um, doing the hiking on the weekends and then there's other projects that I'm working on now that I've got a house, I'm doing all this other stuff. Whereas when, in college, I was reading a, like a, almost reading a, uh, two books a week. I was just pouring through. Um, and so, yeah, the more, the, the less time you have, the more you have to be selective about what you're reading. So like I'm going through a book right now on the history of the, the British empire, which is 900 pages. Um, but yeah, I try to read as much as possible, but again, got other stuff going on now. Yeah. yeah well, you got to make time for reading guys. <laughs> got to do yeah. it. It's important. Vince, your thoughts. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you hear that cliche like to write in order to write well, you have to live well. Well, you you can go out and live or you can go out and write, then you have to balance that. So I mean, if you're writing nonfiction, I can see where you want to get out and do things and create something in your own life worth writing about. If you're writing nonfiction, or I should say if you're writing nonfiction, then yes, that you have to you have to live. If you're writing fiction like I do, I could, if I wanted to, I could never leave my house ever and then continue to churn out stuff that I've just made up from my head. So I, it's it's one of those things. Really? Where, you could you you got that fertile of a of absolutely, an imagination. Absolutely. But 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 the it's key is, but the key is too. It I grew up with Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, David Eddings, um, old Stephen King. So. Turning that over my mind, you, it creates other things as well. So I don't, I mean, I could not leave the house and do just create variations of that. Right. Uh, so it, there, there is there's that aspect. But I do, I like, I like TJ, I like to get out, I like the kayak. I just did that this weekend. I like to hike. I have other projects I'm working on, the Legends of Tabletop. So all those things, but I still carry books with me wherever I go. Like I'll mm -hmm. sit down with my girl. We'll go out to breakfast, and we'll both be sitting there reading. I have to make time for that, whether that's a non. Right, everybody else in the diner probably is on their cell phones, and it, it's you, funny you should you say that. You have your books. Exactly. We were we were leaving the um, the town we had breakfast in, and we we're going through another town that was having a festival. Now I don't know if it was a function of the festival, or this is just a function of this is how society works now. Everyone we passed were two things: they were overweight. And they were on their phone. It was amazing. <laughs> she looked at me. She's like, "You seeing this?" I said, "Absolutely. This is this is where we're at now. This is exactly where we're at now." And I said, "This is great. You know, you and I were in good shape, and we have our books. That's all you need." So, but yeah, it's I I try it's, to it's, read the reading in when I can. Although, if you're, even, if, yeah, go ahead. Even if you have a really fertile imagination, though, I find I tend to be a little bit antisocial. And, and if, if you're just reading books and writing books and you don't get any feedback from real life, your fiction starts to just mirror fiction. As oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Your, yeah. your, your, your characters get less and less realistic. So not necessarily to draw from just to like, you know, keep one foot in reality. Oh yeah. And it's great for dialogue too. You just, you're out and about and you're listening to however, how other people are talking. Yeah, exactly. That that's really important because that's always been very difficult for me. I can write a description until I, you know, all day just write a description of something, but to actually have dialogue flow and sound realistic, almost as you're reading it, it just it's it, it sounds easy as you, you know. Oh, this was easy. This is easy. It's easy to write. Those are the books I think that are amazing. The ones that, for me, when I'm done reading it, one the book seems like a friend, and two it's like oh, wow that. That just that that flowed so well. It's so easy to write. There was no effort. It was just yeah. an enjoyable experience. That's yeah. really that's really difficult to do, and especially with dialogue. Right. Oh, yeah. Now, how how does everyone else handle their dialogue? I mean, do you go do you listen to other conversations too? Do you get that from your reading or just everything in general? I think if you wanted to write a really dysfunctional book, write dialogue the way people actually talk now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I almost, I almost look at it from when writing dialogue, cause I, in some of my books, I really did try to do it as realistically as possible to say, you know, I want my dialogue to be the way people talk, but then you mm -hmm. realize that people are not anywhere near as coherent nowadays. And, and so you almost have to step outside the realm of, of, um, reality and say, this is how people are not coherent or interesting to listen to. 
Right, right. And so your book's not going to make any sense because you're not going to understand them. Because I think I don't think people are fully aware of how much babble in a in a you know biblical sense people have today where they don't understand each other because the words they mean they don't know what they mean. The other person doesn't know what they think they mean, and so they can't communicate and have a, an actual conversation. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the great things about that. I think that's one of the efforts that's going on um, with with people like ourselves, where we try to meet people who can actually speak the same language in a literal sense. Um, what, and so, stringing together buzzwords isn't a meaningful conversation. <laughs> hashtags. <laughs> yeah. I, it, I mean, if you're looking at, um, especially as people's attention spans go down, and then there's more, I, I call it the cable bundling of opinions where, or, or, you know, with code phrases or whatever, where if you say something, people assume you think all this other stuff. And so you're having a conversation about something that you didn't say. I mean, you could write a book if you want to be funny and just show how ridiculous our, our modern conversation and discourse is, you can just write literally. And maybe that might be the idea for a short story. But when I'm writing books where I, I, I want the, the reader to understand, uh, I write the characters as though they actually know how to speak coherently. It's so that pe the reader doesn't get frustrated with you know, how many times does a person say like in their sentence or you know what I mean, or, or all this other stuff that doesn't, it's, it's distracting. And yeah. it, it's, it's kind of, it goes back to my days um, learning how to be a reporter because we were, you would take notes and you would, when you quote somebody, when you put quote, anything you put in quotation marks needs to be the literal, what they actually said. But the, the reporting book that I was reading was talking about how you can't do that as literally as you might think, you can't put every time they say, ah, uh, um, hmm, you know, a pause or whatever, you cut all that stuff out. So, cause the whole point is get telling the reader what they said, not the, the, you know, you don't include the radio chatter or, or background noise uh, when you're reporting on stuff. Right. It, it, it comes down to something I've been sort of working on lately. Like when you really try to start maturing as a writer, you change from, expressing things to trying to create an experience for the reader that is enjoyable. So, you know, you, you, instead of expressing your emotions and showing like how conversations actually work, you realize that you have enough emotion behind you. You don't need to express the way you feel. You rather need to construct a pleasant, enjoyable, entertaining, you know, infotaining, whatever, experience for the reader, where it's it's centered more around the reader having a good or fulfilling, rather, experience, rather than you expressing, well, this is how good I am at reproducing dialogue, and this show, is how I feel. Show, don't tell, right? Isn't that what you're basically saying? Show, sort don't of, tell? Sort of. But if I can be reductive. I, 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 guess, I guess I'm saying more create an experience, don't replicate your own experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I got, I got a question in the, uh, in the chat from our uh, friend uh, Jennifer Logan. Uh, she asks, um, uh, what are you guys' thoughts on actual physical book printing versus the audio and ebook formats? I don't know if I, I don't know if I have a, uh, I mean, I guess I prefer books and just the, you know, like for aesthetic reasons, I like to have actual books, but there, there are ways in which eBooks can be really um, handy and, and really, uh, uh, you know, um, where having an eBook can, can be convenient. Like it, like if you're, if it's dark and you don't have access to a light, you can read, you can carry it with you wherever you go. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's, it's, I know that there is, uh, I mean, I, I have enough of the, I guess the old timey snob, snob in me and, and the esthete about me to, to prefer the look of the, of the old style book. Uh, and of course I love going to used bookstores and getting books off the shelf from, you know, the 1920s or thirties and what mm -hmm. thrilling to how books used to look and feel and stuff. But I think the ebook is a, I mean, I hate to just, I, I might just be the, uh, the, the, the annoying resident optimist here. Like we're, we're all, we're going in a great direction, guys. Don't, don't, uh, I mean, look on the bright side, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think that technology is, uh, it can be helpful. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, 
it's expanded our repertoire of um, what we can do, uh, you know, and and it, de it depends on how you use it. But I mean, it's it's expanded the convenience of of things in, in a lot of ways, and so and I, I know I probably wouldn't have sold, I I, I wouldn't sell as many uh, uh, copies of books as I do if not for the ebook format. So I'm thankful for it in that way too. So what what percentage? I'm just curious about it. What percentage of of your books are ebook, and what uh, what percentage are you know paper? I don't actually. I don't know. Um, I don't have any idea. I mean, uh, it would it would be a, just a rough estimate. Um, but but I, I just I get the feeling that you know people buy ebooks who wouldn't buy just the paperback or certainly the, the books that I have available in hardcover. Does anybody buy hardcover? The the amount of money that you can charge for an ebook, it sometimes can be low enough that it can overcome that threshold of a reader. Yeah, you know, exactly. Decide, yeah, deciding whether or not to take a chance on a new author. Like you can sell ebooks for two ninety nine. You can't even ship a regular book for two ninety nine. Yeah, that's that's good. It seems like that there's a uh, it, uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to all of them because you're uh, with with Kindle, you can carry around hundreds of books in in the of a, a small little pamphlet sized book, uh, but so you don't have to deal with all the space things. But at the same time, your Kindle breaks and all those books are gone. Um, your physical books don't disappear when your when electronics fail. Um, and then there's audio books where if you just you you're not able to look it down at something, maybe you just do a lot of commuting or you do a lot of traveling and driving. You can listen to a lot of books and. I was thinking about this recently. Our the the sudden interest in audiobooks almost harkens back to the original format in which stories were told, which was oral tradition. They were recited, um, you know, like with Beowulf and other uh, books like that. They were later written down, but they were originally uh, told just verbally. Somebody would memorize the whole thing and then pass it on to somebody else. So I think that they all have a place. That's the policy I have for my books uh, on when I publish them and have them for sale. If somebody buys the physical print version, they get the Kindle version for free because I want people to have both versions. I think diversifying with books is, um, is a good thing because they all have their advantages and disadvantages. So it's all a question of if you're a minimalist and you, you don't have a lot of space, a Kindle is great. But if you're, you're trying to settle down and build the build a library and have that traditional parlor or, or den, then having the physical books is good. Well, I was what I was going to say was what I like about the electronic format of a book is, you know, I'm all about immediate gratification. Yeah, you guys probably can tell it about me. So I want to be able to <laughs> I want to be able to go on there and say, I want this now. You know, I'm in the mood to read this. I don't want to have to wait right. for you know UPS to bring it to my house, man. Right. Yeah, that's that is a huge advantage of Kindle and a huge advantage of a lot of different things where it provides that immediate you get it um, and it's downloaded and you can start reading it right away. Um, <laughs> I think that I think there's some people who still like the idea of having a physical book, and I I do like that as well, where I'm able to write inside of the 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 book or or just draw, and you can go back and just think about what you were where you were at in life when you were reading this book, because that's what I have for a lot of the books that I've read but in college. What, what was cool, because like even like your book when I was reading it, um, like I went through like I went through half the book that night, and then the e-readers like tell told me exactly where I left off. Yeah, yeah, that's. Cool. I mean, I didn't have to like, I didn't have to dog ear the page or anything. You know what I mean? Yeah, it. I'm not sure where the industry is going as far as formats. I just think diversifying because at some point I don't have any of my books on audio, but um, that's something I'm probably going to change in the future and just get it out there. Um, but I think that. Okay, can you hire me to to do the Irish? Uh, oh, the, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually, I, I wanted some deep. Uh, some you have to be voice. hired. You have to get paid for your voice work. <laughs> uh, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, you can pay me by just you know noting me and you know saying you know uh, voice voice of the mix provided by John Steele. <laughs> <you know. laughs> <laughs> uh, well, for those who haven't read his book, there's a lot of uh, uh, ethnic tension between the Irish and the Italians, and uh, TJ wrote like he wrote the way the Irish speak phonetically. You know what I mean? So. Is this like is this like Gangs of New York? Uh, part, no, it's not. The, the book isn't anything like Gangs of New York. The book takes place in the 30s, but the the way that they talk is there is literally off the boat Irish in this town of Bever this town of Beverly. So okay. um, they they talk like that. The premise just sounded similar. That's all. I, 
that's why I was asking. No. Yeah, yeah. The what's funny is um, that same time period. The, when you, when you had these huge immigration waves, you also had the ethnic tensions of all these new people showing up. And um, in the '30s, you had the the Irish and the Italian gangs, like the the mafiosos, and then the, the Irish mob, and it's particularly in Chicago, um, where that really intensified. So um, that was part of the inspiration for having that in this small town. Yeah, and and, and actually, uh, TJ's book is a lot more violent than uh, Gangs of New York, but but. <laughs> Vince, if, if, if Vince, could you tell us about um, uh, your book? Oh yeah, it's essentially it takes place in New York in 1884, and you can think of it as Tesla, uh, Nikola Tesla, meets an ex Civil War cavalry sergeant named Dennis Malone, and you can think of them as the first Ghostbusters. I wanted to mix um, a little bit of steampunk with with urban fantasy and cosmic horror. There's some there's some flavors of H.P. Lovecraft and Call of Cthulhu in there. But, you know, that is a great that is a great great pitch. I really love okay. that. Thank you. An 1884 so, Ghostbuster version of Ghostbusters. Essentially, like, yeah. A, yeah. A century um, a century prior to Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so who is so the, the character of uh, Dennis Malone? Uh, he he is. Would you is he more like? Um, Dan Aykroyd, or is he more like Bill Murray? Or <laughs> he's a little more stoic than that. Um, I would put him maybe a mix between Dan like Aykroyd, the other guy, like whatever the scientist was, Harold Ramis. Yeah, right. Harold yeah, Ramis. exactly. So it's a quick read. I think it's like 65, 70 pages. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, I wanted I wanted this series to be novella size. Just to, you, you read it in a day, you enjoy it. It's it's candy for your mind, and then you go about your business. So. Yeah, that was like Andy's uh, the Columbine Pilgrim. Um, hmm. That was that was a quick read. I, I got a kick out of the way Andy. What was that? You had uh, it was prologue and chapter one. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Were, and then, yeah, and, and then the you know the rest of the the idea being that the rest of the chapters are are as yet unwritten, but who knows what will follow. Yeah, well, there was yeah, there's a lot of uh, well. Here's something I want to ask: is it it's um, takes place in all of your works? Well, I can't, Vincent. I, 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 I uh, I'm ashamed to say it. I have yet to read that book, but no, that's right. When you get to it, you get to it. Yeah, I'll get to it. Well, because we only have known each other just through the. We haven't even had a one on one yet. Um, no, no. We, we I think it's been like two weeks since we met. So. Yeah. So yeah. So, give me time, brother. Give me time. I swear to God, I'll get to it. <laughs> Um, but one thing I've noticed, like um, in like in Andy's books, especially, like, there's lots of violence. Don't don't. Not the question isn't coming yet, Andy. There's lots of violence in Andy's books. Um, Anne's most, I believe it's her most recent novel, The Scene Vendetta. There's a lot of violence. In, I mean, that's just violence. There's killing. There's murder. Yeah, and, and there, there's there's actually literally millions of dead people in there if you count the underground graveyard that they shoot each other in. Wow. Nice. Yeah. So, and, and, and TJ, don't even get me started on your shit, man. I mean, you were, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, Jesus Christ, man, you were, you were killing people left and right in your book. And you, and so you didn't violence is way. You. Is that why you, why you decided to bring us, the four of us together was four <laughs> violent authors? Uh, I, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe on our Freudian level, that's what it was about. You know, who knows? <laughs> I, 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 my team. Shit. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Uh, uh, John, I gotta send you the stringer so you can read that because it's. I don't think it's nearly as violent um, uh, as as Men Who Walk Alone. Um, but I also, I don't know. It's kind of funny because I'm not. I, most people got the reaction you did when they read it because I don't come off as a very. <clears throat> no, you don't. That's what they, freaked me out. <laughs> I think it's because I have it under control, right? Uh, <laughs> whereas other people. You know, it's like what they say whenever you, the, the most dangerous person is the, the quietest one, right? Yeah, and by the way, you know, I don't know if you should have said that, you know, because for those who don't know, TJ literally lives in a cabin in the woods. No, okay. No. I don't, <laughs> that's part of the appeal. I actually the Unabomber. Don't, I don't live in a in a cabin in the woods, um, but I do live in, in the middle of the mountains. But the inside cool. looks like a cabin, but no, I'm not. I'm not like, <laughs> <God>. <laughs> 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 But but no, that makes makes me think. <laughs> okay, but no, but okay, but and so in, in uh, the the scene vendetta, I was curious about this because this that genre was uh, for those who are familiar with it. It's, um, it's kind of like um, how do I say it? Like it's 
like a Rob, uh, Robert Ludlum esque type of novel, would you say? Yeah, it's kind of uh, it's it, it's like a really violent spy thriller revenge noir terrorist novel. <laughs> yeah, which is not. Well, because um, that doesn't seem like you don't strike me as someone that was running out and reading a lot of like Clive Cussler and Robert Ludlum or I don't know who else or Brad Thor, uh, mm-hmm. who I guess would be more that would be more the terrorist uh, revenge type stuff or or even the, the, yeah. some of the Tom Clancy stuff where he wrote like what John Clark's uh, characters. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is a really new new genre for me. I usually write like science fiction or literary fiction or comic fiction. And- uh, somebody just asked me to write this. He said, you, you, you write this, I'll publish it. So I wrote it, and I just had an absolute blast writing it. I was like, why have I not been writing this genre my entire life? I hate people and want them all to die. This is perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so so uh, you and Andy hang out a lot together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can you tell? Uh, I exaggerate slightly mm-hmm. for comic effects. I don't. Oh, well, I, I, I got a technical question because I'm I'm new to having multiple people in live stream. I am actually having to click on your your icons to get you to show up when you're talking. So is there a way that I can just because I don't know what I did, but I uh, is it there should be with the live stream where you where you'll just your names will pop up when you do talk. It should do that automatically. I'm not. I yeah. don't know why that's happening actually. But there might be if you go to the gear and check your settings. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, oh, and just in case Aaron Clary is listening, that occasional scraping noise is not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's not saying that there. But anyway, sorry, yeah. sorry to the audience if you know you're not seeing the person's avatar pop up when they talk. I don't know what I'm doing. Like I said, I'm I'm learning as I go here, guys. So um, uh, let's see. Opening up cameraman. I don't know if that did it. That might have done it. Let's see. S- someone say something. Something. Hello. Oh, that did it. All right, sweet. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> see, I'm, I'm learning here. It's, it's a learning experience for all of us, not just about writing and everything like that. But the, um, the, the uh, events, what do, you, what do you have to say about uh, violence, fiction, and novels? Like, what, what's, uh, what's your feelings on that? Oh, that's fine. I mean, I... <laughs> <they're all fine. laughs> that's whatever, yeah. I mean, whatever you want. To um, Sorry, that's a great answer. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. Violence is fine. It's good. I'm good it's violence. Good. <laughs> that works. If it, if it drives, <laughs> if it drives the story, then sure. Um, I you just can't make a book all about violence, but if there's a great plot and characterization and dialogue, sure, why not? Now, for myself, the series of the Tesla Malone series that I'm writing, which I'm finishing up my developmental edits for the second one, which hopefully will be out by the end of the month. Um. There's, there's violence. I don't have a lot of killing, uh, but it, it, it may happen. It may not. It, whatever I think where the characters take me, where the where the plot takes me, that will uh, that will. Be the so, so if, in other words, if you were at like, if you go out and uh, if you're doing your writing after you and your girlfriend, you know, see a lot of fat people on cell phones, there would be more killing than. There would right? yes, there there would absolutely be a lot more killing. In fact, I probably once we're done. With this interview, I will hop on my uh, my my uh, editing program and probably throw in a little bit of violence there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, just <laughs> sprinkle in there. It's like salt, you know. Um, exactly. You got to. I've got to say something to that also. I mean, first of all, I don't know how violent of an author I really am. I, I know the Columbine Pilgrim is a very violent book, but other than that, I don't know if any of my fiction is what I would call terribly violent. Um, but I would say. You know, well, similar I mean, a hard killer like you had uh, a rape scene. Um, there, yeah, there was. Well, I mean, in well, there it, there was sort of a rape. It was more of a seduction scene. But in Columbine Pilgrim, there was a there was a rape scene, a very disturbing rape scene. Not that any rape, not that all rape isn't disturbing, mind you. But but um, <laughs> but what I was wanting to say in response to what was just being said, you you, you it's true. You just never know where things are going to take you. And that one particular scene uh, that, that you just alluded to, or that I just alluded to in, in Columbine Pilgrim, I didn't know that it was going to happen until just before it happened. Um, and that's part of one of the, one of the things about when you're writing, when, when you, the, the muses are singing to you and you're, you're inspired, um, you don't, you, you're going where they take you. And, and uh, 
you know, I had no idea things were going to take me that particular direction. But once I saw that had to happen, then, then I saw it had to happen. Uh, and uh, that's, that's an interesting thing about the writing process, I find. Well, here's a question to all of you then. How much of this writing process is the music singing to you and how much of it is you forcing, I'm going to get three pages out of me today no matter what. I'm not leaving the keyboard until I get it. Um, um, <clears throat> oh, good, for, you? No, um, for, for me, when I first started out, it was totally the 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 creativity i i know i i did some uh set writing sessions when i would just go for hours and hours and hours i think um one section of a book i spent the whole day writing it would it was over i think thirteen thousand words but i cranked that out in a day just nice. without just wow. without stopping you know i went to like eat or whatever but uh now it's a little bit harder and i think it's because you i wasn't thinking back then about all the different structure and style i was just letting whatever was on my mind uh going now i almost hesitate and i got to work really hard uh it reminds me of that scene from that that finding forester where sean connery takes out the typewriter and just starts typing away and the the kid who's there um isn't typing and he goes what are you doing he goes i'm thinking he goes no no that comes later you just write and then you editing is when you think and that's something i have to i have to uh be very mindful about when i go to write because then i start second guessing my own uh natural uh, creativity. Well, the, you know, I actually had a question, a pre-planned question about editing. Uh, should what are your feeling about editing your own works? No, I mean, not in any official capacity. You can go uh, back and read it for construction, but I, you need another eye on that, right? Yeah, yeah. You need, I mean, you need somebody to look at it because w the problem I have is I will fill in the gaps with my own, the, the, the book that I have in my head doesn't always go onto the, to the paper, electronically speaking. And so somebody else needs to read it and say, well, this part doesn't make any sense or this part, mm -hmm. I, I don't really know about that. And, which le leads me to another frustration um, that I think a lot of writers have is getting <clears throat> people they know to read their work who you know then say, are you going to write another book? Are you going to do this book? Are you going to do something? And then you go, well, do you want to read it? And then they, <laughs> they cower. <laughs> yeah. So, but Ann, you're, uh, at least you were, uh, worked as a, an editor professionally. That's what you did for the longest time. Yeah, I, I still do that. I, I, I go straight and I edit. So a lot of the time for, for the sake of, you know, just the way the publishing industry is nowadays, I have to edit my own stuff. But I would prefer to have another person, you know, give me some input. But that's not always possible. Fortunately, you know, I have those skills and I can do it to myself. Um, but yeah, it, it it would be beneficial to have a second opinion. Well, the I think Ann, I think Anne's referring more to uh, just sheer grammar, uh, grammatical questions, which she's very good at. I mean, I know better than me, probably better than than everybody on the panel. I'm just guessing just because I know how, how good she is at that. But but um, that's one consideration. But but also, I think it seems like what the others were discussing were stylistic questions of, you know. Yeah, and should, overall, should this does this here, make this sense? Is this, is, yeah. this, is this entertaining? What, what I really right, want to know right. at this point is, like, not does this make sense? I've got that kind of down. I want to know, are you having fun reading this? Yes. Yeah, that's where beta, beta readers come in handy. Yeah. Well, uh, the safety doc asks in the chat, he goes, uh, how much of the writing process is developing an outline, or do you just take off and type? Not fiction, but my PhD dissertation outline was 40 pages for 177, uh, 177 page paper. That's a big outline. Oh, for wow. Yeah. That's, that, is, that is true. I mean, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I do something called story beats, where I'll, I'll just say, all right, I'm going to do eight to 10 chapters, and then I'll go ahead and in each chapter, and maybe one to five paragraphs, I'll have what takes place in that chapter. Now, I don't always stick to it, but it's, it's it, I especially starting out, it's good to have that so you can pace yourself. Right. I, I, I never outline. I've never written an outline. Really? No. Nope. That's impressive. Andy is an example of the when we ask the born made question, Andy falls in more to the born <laughs> category. <laughs> yeah. I, I almost I almost look at it as 
writing, I do it outlines now for each chapter and I, it, it's basically a synopsis of what happens in this chapter and where it mm -hmm. ends. And I almost look at it because I, before I was going to be a writer, I was actually going to go into cinematography. I was really interested in doing video production and all that. And I now look at writing a scene almost like filming the scene as mm. if you were doing a movie. Now, yeah. you, you can't think of that the same way necessarily because um, the can't, you know, you can put in people's thoughts in a book. You could just a whole different um, dynamic going on when you're writing. Um, than when you're doing a film. But if you're trying to show and not tell, then you can also t take that into consideration. And I actually use a book that was written by a Hollywood scriptwriter about how to write stories. And so it, it applies to movies, but you can take the same thing and do it with books. And so you understand the, the necessity of having a subplot to help drive the story forward and keep it going and, and not run into a rut where it just gets really boring. Uh, cliches that you want to leave out ways to avoid getting the character stuck in a, in a situation that really doesn't work for, for the film. And that can ruin a lot of stories where you read it and it just doesn't, the ending doesn't work. Right. Well, one, one thing I just got, I want to say, uh, just shout out to Jennifer in the chat. She said, uh, Hemingway said, quote, write drunk and edit sober. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And uh, well, you know, if, if, if drinking is involved, you know, I may get it, may, then maybe I'll get into the whole, this whole writing gig, you know? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know how effective people can be at writing um, when when they've had something to drink because then you can't even think coherently enough. Hey, speak I, for I yourself, so. buddy. <laughs> I think Hemingway, even though Hemingway was a drunk himself, I think he meant that metaphorically. Oh, okay. All right, whatever. Yeah, oh, I, I, I can't write drunk. I can't. Nope. Yeah. But you come up, come up with good ideas when you're drunk. That's true, but executing them <laughs> is a completely different kettle of fish. Are they good ideas, or are they just? Yeah, if you're sipping whiskey, I mean, you can do that. You can write while you're sipping whiskey, but not where you're, you know, drinking half of a, uh, or where you're pounding beer or anything like that. Um, but you want. Oh, yeah. it, I think it helps, especially for what, if you're trying to write a certain type of book. You want to be surrounded. I think that might be an interesting discussion. Is do you feel like being in a certain environment helps spur creativity? Ah, yes. I, one of the things that I enjoy about hiking as I go out there and in fact has inspired a, a, a book of some kind that I'm working on is going out into the mountains and looking up at uh, where I live in the Cascades. It's got this very European Alp German feel to it. So it just looks like something where you would have set uh, a Tolkien Lord of the Rings novel. And if they weren't going to shoot the movies in New Zealand, they could have come over here and done it. So that helps in, in, inspire and, and, uh, kind of stir the imagination that's that's interesting because that's that's similar to what i when i was talking about the muses i mean it sounds like what you're saying is nature was your muse uh right. in that circumstance and right. um oh go ahead no go ahead oh i would just say i'd look at the the mountains and especially when there's a mist so there's it, you can see it but you can't see all of it and you're thinking well what's beyond that mist what's beyond that mountain on the other side like imagine if there was an entirely different world there that was hidden from kind of like the right. lost world, except, you know, in the mountains and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I also say I have stuff around my desk that kind of just, I feel like puts me in the right mood for writing. Um, I've got like an old 1930 general electric radio and this, uh, mm. like, we're all this world war two memorabilia that I have um, that kind of gives that writing feel to it. I don't know if but everybody's got their own, their own thing that they like. Yeah, Vince, what what do you do to get into uh, a, a place where the muses will speak? Well, fundamentally, I'm a lazy bastard, so I, I sometimes <laughs> say, look, sit down and just whatever it is, write, just write for about half an hour. Um, and then after that gets set, I'll let that percolate, and that usually is good to springboard myself further. But there'll, there'll be days where I don't, I'm just thinking about the story and letting it percolate. Um, and there are days where I just sit down and I'll pound out a thousand or a few thousand words, uh, but I don't. I don't try. To, I don't try to force it. I, that doesn't really work for me. But okay. when the, yeah, when the inspiration hits me, which is usually, I mean, if, it, if if there was like a two week span where I wasn't doing, I would just, hey, look, Vince, sit the fuck down and just write something. But once I'm in a groove, every day, every other day, I'm writing something. So. And and I'm guessing your muse is is what like uh, Chicago police sirens. I don't know what. what... <laughs> uh -huh. it, it comes and goes. Sometimes I really feel like writing when I should. The literal sirens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
instead of the sirens of the sea. Yeah, like I'll, I'll be I'll be completely exhausted from work, and suddenly I'll find that for some reason I'm able to carry over and keep writing. But I, I there there's no real atmosphere I need. I just need to you know have have the right balance of I don't actually have to get any work done right now and I have enough energy to concentrate. Hmm. Well, here's a here's a question um uh, we'll, we'll just go around we'll start with Andy and we'll work through. Um how do you feel the uh, tone or the themes that you enjoy writing about now or maybe it's not even enjoying maybe you that you're sure unconscious is forcing you write about now has changed since you know your first novel up until now or maybe it hasn't changed I don't know tell you tell go for it Eddie that's in well um, it's an interesting question because I I'm uh, you know just just to speak retrospectively and, and not 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 get too tedious about it or anything but I, I had a, a period of time when I was when the muses were very much singing to me like um, I would date it from 2010 till maybe uh, early 2014. I mean, a good solid period where I just was writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. And, and that was when I, the time period that I've done most of my fiction writing. Um, I haven't really written much fiction over the course of my life, but during that specific period, I was moved to write fiction. Um, and I know that's the subject of this whole uh this whole this, this whole discussion is fiction writers, even though I'm, you know, a lot of what I've written has been nonfiction. But um, so, how has it changed? Um, I mean, it's 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 varied fr from uh, it, it's it's all it, it is. It really is. I hate to keep going back, sounding like a broken record here, but it is. I mean, I, I'm the one who's invoked. The muses, and I really do think, you know, for me, that's how it has worked. Like, for a time when I was when I was writing the Columbine Pilgrim, Columbine, the Columbine event was was my muse. I mean, I know that sounds strange, maybe a little creepy, but uh, that was what was. I mean, I was eat, eating, sleeping, drinking Columbine, um, and uh, and so then um, it kind of went on from whatever I was working on at that period of time. And a couple of times my muses have literally been, been women. Um, mm. and so, do, so do tell, do tell. Oh, well, I mean, I, I don't know how much I want to tell, but I'm just saying, <laughs> not, 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 they haven't been, uh, necessarily women who have been a huge part of my life, but just have, have, uh, you know, made a powerful, uh, uh impression upon me. Um, uh, when I wrote, the, uh, the doctor and the heretic that was under the influence of a particular muse who was a woman. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. And, and, uh, also, uh, beauty in the least was, was as well, um, different woman. So, uh, but, but muses come in, what, what inspires you kind of comes and goes and, Lately, I mean, since that time period, since the since since early 2014, I haven't. It hasn't. I've been in a bit of a rut for the last four years or so. I have, it's not that I've haven't been writing at all, but I, I haven't been as inspired as I was during that during that magical period. And I, I hope that I can get back to it somehow, well, somewhere. You, you have been producing a lot of content, but you're writing more e essays and social commentary, and you're YouTubing right. and, and podcasting an awful lot. So it's not like you're just. Yeah just sitting back and not doing anything. And, and also you have other uh, personal professional responsibilities besides uh, writing. So yeah, um, sure. it's not like you're, you've dropped off the scene or, you know, you're just yeah. kind of switching gears a little while. I also, you know, I'm going to like psychoanalyze you a little bit, but I think partly like during that time period, some of the works that you wrote were almost like a uh, self therapy a little bit. Oh, sure. And, you know, a lot of those issues, it's kind of like, well, you know, I, I've resolved them and they were the things that were. So I remember when I when I did it, oh, I, by the way, I did a one on one interview with Andy. You can find it back in the, the archives. It's quite some time ago, but it's there. And I remember something you said to me. I, I'll never forget it. You said that when you were writing the Columbine Pilgrim, you felt compelled to get it out of you. I remember you saying that, like, mm -hmm. you had a fear that, like, I, I, if I die before this is done, I'm, you know what I mean? It was just like something that yeah. had to be said. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. I mean, I'd forgotten, 
I'd forgotten that I told you that. I'd forgotten uh, being in that state of mind. But it, yeah, during during the writing of that particular uh, 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 manuscript, uh, which became a book, a short book, um, yeah, I had that this 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 really urgent feeling that I had to get this done. I had to, had to get this done soon, um, and that it would just be terrible and tragic if I die. And I had no, I I didn't think I was. I didn't have any reason to think I was about to die, but but uh, I just I just feared dying before finishing. I, I've never had that sense of urgency before or since with anything. Well, that, I mean, that's that's motivation, though, right there. And I'm I'm glad you got you know I'm glad you didn't yeah. die, Andy, because I would never know about Tony. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, the Tony Ant Meander is the uh, protagonist of the of that novel. Um, but uh, yeah, really really disturbed young man. Um, but. Uh, yes. <laughs> but it, it, it was a great read. I loved it. Um, with nothing at all in common with his his the, the one person who authored it. He's not the avatar. He's not he's not the avatar of of uh, of uh, Andy Nowicki. But Anne, you, I remember uh, I, when I asked you a question one time about um, uh, why you wanted to write science fiction. Because by, by the way, Anne, the, you um, life. I think you ended up publishing that like in a serialized form or something. Um, you sent me the book, but I don't think it was you published it ever as a book. Did you? Yeah, I, uh, I, I'd been shopping around for a publisher for that for years, and I'd been being told that um, it wasn't a commercial enough idea. Well, this, this winter, um, a, a very commercial science fiction series came out on Netflix called Carbon 13, which had a very similar premise to the book that yeah. I you know, spent, spent years writing. So I had to quickly serialize it and put out the first volume so that I wouldn't look like I was writing Carbon 13 fan fiction, even though you know my book antedated Carbon 13, which was kind of an embittering experience. I meant for that to go through a regular publisher, but I, I kind of had no choice. I'm putting out the uh, second volume later this summer, but uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, no. The reason I was bringing that up was because uh, we were talking about um, a lot of times characters in books become avatars for the authors. You mentioned this when I had interviewed you, and Andy was kind of you know j jokingly saying you know Tony Meander is not is Andy's avatar. And mm -hmm. when I had interviewed you about why you kind of made the leap to science fiction because it wasn't like what I had read of you. I mean, it wasn't like you know Nose Whim or, and you said pretty much because of that that you didn't want the the uh, character to be your avatar in any way. You wanted to distance yourself as much as possible from the, the, the characters in the book, make them totally independent creations of your own personality. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to some degree I failed, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's one motivation for writing science fiction. But I, I, I think I alluded to earlier, my project lately is to make my books less self-expression and more an experience for the reader, like to, to be a little bit more reader centric, not pandering to the lowest common denominator or whatever, but just making sure that what I'm writing isn't getting my emotions out on the page, but rather getting something that's good to read out on the page, which I'm, I'm kind of struggling with that a little bit right now, because as I'm preparing the second book in the, in the life slash electives revenge series, I also had an inspiration this summer for a book about um, a group of friends whose friends are all dying young. And that's something that's been happening to me a lot lately. I'm like 43 and like 90% of my friends are dead or dying. And it's, it's been kind of a bizarre wrenching experience. And I had um, an inspiration to write a novel about that experience because I think a lot of people in Generation X, people who are our, our age, that's going to resonate with us because our lives were kind of kind of cut off at the knees in a lot of ways. You know, we're the forgotten generation or whatever. And I feel like there are a lot of people our age who can identify with that feeling that like our lives never started and they've kind of already passed us by and all my friends are dying. But like reconciling a subject that, that's that personal for me with my overall project of like, I have to make this entertaining and fun or at least meaningful for the reader as opposed to just expressing my own shit like that's kind of difficult to wrestle on the page it was well, a lot easier it was a lot easier to do that this time. what you're saying about like friends dying i mean i, I can relate to that i lost a, a lifelong friend uh, just over two years or almost two years ago um 
and I uh, on nine eleven I lost five guys I grew up with in one day. Oh Jesus! Um, so um, and some of them like I was you know knew better. I mean I don't know I grew up in New York where it's very densely populated, so you'd know these people, but and. You had grown up with them as kids, but you know I kind of lost touch with them all. But you know, one of them, uh, I, I got. I went to since I went from like nursery school, you know, on up with that guy, you know. Yeah. And I, it, it was, you know, it's a hell of a thing when so many young people are just, uh, you know, out of your life like that. It, it's it's literally incomprehensible. So I, I can I can kind of relate to that feeling of losing so many people, and then and just growing up where I did, uh, there was a lot of people that died of. Uh, suicides and uh, just drugging, drinking or drugging themselves to death. So I, I feel you on that. And, and it's, um, it's tough to do. I don't really have any advice. It's just, I, I just I'm commiserating, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. How do, you, how do, you, do you have five? I'm sorry. You, you had five of your friends who worked at the world trade center. Uh, no, not all. Well, four of them did. And one of them was farming. Wow. 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ann. I didn't interrupt you. Oh no, that's 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 just pretty awful. But well, it's about you guys, not me. Remember that. Come on. Uh, mm -hmm. Next up, um, uh, Vince. What do you got to say on that on that uh, on that issue, if anything, about, uh, for example, like uh, experiencing loss and how that affects you as a writer? Um, that's a good question. I I can use. I mean, not. Maybe not the specifics of the loss itself, but I could use that emotion as fodder or as motivation. I lost uh, my mother this June 30th was two years. Um, and that was a rough time for my family. Um, and someone just deteriorate before your eyes and then, you know, essentially being in the room and hold their hand as they go. It's, not, it's a very sobering uh, experience. So... I mean, I didn't. I don't write about that specifically, but it, it does. It does come out. I mean, there are certain aspects of of the writing where it will uh, that will reflect the sadness. Um, but I could use, like I said, I could use that uh, not to disrespect uh, disrespect the loss, but it's part of who I am. So, it, in, as in any character I create, there is a part of me, even a small part of me in that character. So I, but I don't let it, I don't let it bog down too much. And I try to keep it light and keep my characters enjoyable. So I'm trying to be too personal. Right. Uh, TJ, uh, same year. You, well, you're the youngest here. So hopefully you have, you have yet to experience anything really, uh, horrific, but, um, yeah, I, the only time that I really had to deal with that was when a childhood friend of mine died. Um, he was a Marine in, in Iraq. And so that, was when I really had to come to terms with the reality that death affects everybody. And it's not just someone else who's going to have to deal with it. Um, <clears throat> but what's interesting for my generation, this is something that I want to write a book on or a novel on at some point is not so much the death of somebody, but the death of what we thought things were going to be when we were growing up and then having the world. I mean, if you think about all the things that have changed, um, even when, you know, when you guys were younger, but also when I was, we, I was raised then, you know, went out to college and whatever, thinking that life was going to be a certain way. But it occurred to me um, over time that that life was dead, that the, the life that was supposed to be is, was never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I don't know what other, well, um, I guess you would call them millennials have had to deal with that, but that was definitely for me, the worst encounter with death, but that was more of not a physical death. That was a death of, um, uh, a psychological of what you thought the world was going to be and um, w how you thought your life was going to be. Oh, yeah. From our point of view as Generation X writers, when we were young and very young children and deciding that we wanted to be writers, being a novelist was still like a big deal. It was a career path. It was something you could do. But there, there weren't, you know, YouTube stars. You didn't have PewDiePie being the most famous, you know, cultural current in society. And we've seen this just absolutely massive shift. And sticking to your guns through that is kind of massively depressing. Well, that's why God invented Prozac. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Actually, speaking right. to speaking to Anne's point about depression, uh, Jennifer says uh, Anne lives in Chicago. No wonder she wants humanity to die. <laughs> yeah, and what yeah. the hell are you getting out of that? I don't think it's healthy for you psychologically, Anne. You need to be like do what TJ does and go like commune with psychologically people. or otherwise. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Forget about psychologically. You know, you might get shot. Um, that, that city's not going anyplace good anytime soon. You need to get the hell out of there. Yeah, I need to get out of here as soon as my lease is up. I'm just trying to decide where to go. Um, I've 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 tried the moving back to a small town trick, and that that resulted in Nisquam, the book where you know an eight year old child child spoiler alert, spoiler alert something terrible happens to an eight year old child in that book. Like small towns aren't all that cracked up to be either. Um, yeah, that that is true. Um, people have this perception of small town America. Um, uh, but it's always late or delayed. So what they think it is, that's may have what it was 20, 15 years ago, but we're, I would say, especially in my state, we're witnessing the transformation um, of sorts. Um, so it's, mm. they, they think of it as like this 1950s, you know, wholesome corn fed, you know, this is God's country. And then you go show up and you're like, oh, it's not a whole lot different from what... <laughs> Yeah. What's going on in the city? It's just occurring in in, in a smaller um, vicinity, in a in a more encapsulated sphere of misery. Yeah, with more, <laughs> more, with more opioid abuse. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of drug abuse in small towns right now. Now, is this is this just the result of what 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 we now popularly call globalism, or is this the result of I don't know the erosion of values that uh, I, or, yeah. or what? I think it's, I mean, to not go on for it for a long time, I think it's the deconstruction of just everything that makes life, like that gives people meaning and purpose and agency in life. And um, along with, you know, economic problems that, that that's struggling, um, I think people don't realize it, but they, they don't have an identity that's healthy or productive or just good. Like they're, um, it's hard to put a fine point on it, but once you realize it, you you can see it in what's going on. And I think that that's the biggest thing is they just don't don't understand why they're like the only thing that you're allowed to do or care about or or believe is just to be indifferent. Um, and I I don't know. I, I people and it's also the fact that everything that people do is being controlled in, in a city three thousand miles away by a handful of people that get to set policy about what you do in your schoolroom. So. It, there's a sense of just helplessness, like they don't have control over their, their fate and situation. Yeah, and people people everywhere spend so much time, uh, as we are now, on the internet. That <laughs> right. uh, even, if, even if you are a big fish in a small town in your small town, like even if you're the mayor of your small town, you go online and you just see, well, there are 7 billion other people out there and I don't really have a place in this world. <laughs> That's what you, I mean. Oh, man, I'm, so I'm sorry to laugh, but is that is that is, the, is does it have to be that bad? I mean, does getting on the internet have to just result in you feeling your own impotency and meaninglessness? Well, I, I am sick right now. Well, <laughs> it, it kind of goes back to what John and I were talking about before we started the stream. This the atomization of society to the point where people don't have a holistic relationship with somebody. They may work with them, but they don't you know have anything else in common with them. Um, they typically back in the day, if you lived in the same town, there, there was these core values um, and beliefs or traditions or whatever uh, that you would have. And so you wouldn't have to deal with the situation that we have now where everybody you have to be diplomatic or you can't talk about certain things or you can't uh, you, you have to go out of your way to just hang out with people. Uh, trying to get four people together for something is, is a challenge because you may not live in the same area. You may commute. Your kids don't go to the same school. You're, all this weird stuff that just causes uh, uh, de it destabilizes relationships and inhibits the, and inhibits healthy relationships from forming to begin with. Right, because it, it's kind of like we were talking about on the uh, Aaron's podcast, the Older Brother podcast. Uh, if if you know if you, somebody's gone through the same collective experience as you, you know they've either grown up together, or they've gone through the same job or whatever. You immediately have this rapport, so you don't have to spend a lot of time getting to know that person. You just know f from that um, 
who they are and you can immediately start building some kind of a relationship beyond that but now it's like you got to start all over every time somebody moves or you, you just fall out they go their different ways i think the other one is the whole marriage situation where um, people would typically get married at young at a certain age and then but now you've got people getting married at all different ages and it's, it's just a different stage in life so what i've experienced mm -hmm. in my own life is when my friends get married it's I, i'm acknowledging the fact that they are now shifting over towards their family and they're just not going to have the same amount of time to hang out um and all that other stuff and so when people are doing this at different ages it just causes problems with um trying to coordinate and hang out because they're they're focused on their family and you're focusing on other stuff yeah yeah or in my case i i always have the problem is that uh you know my, when my friends get married is their their wives always hate me Oh, there's different theories for that. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is, but you know, they, and they also and they always insist that I never get to be the one that uh, plans the bachelor party. I have no idea why that is either, but <laughs> but um, uh, this, so anyway, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up soon. I know it's going well, but I always like to keep the audience hungry for more. Uh, so um, I'm gonna start with Vince. What do you got going on in the works? Okay, you said you're working on a new novel or, or a, a, a sequel to the, what, what you already put out there. Uh, well, tell us a little bit. Of, tell us. Well, just tell tell us about it, what you can without giving anything away and other projects you're working on, including uh, the, your other website, Legends of uh, Tabletop. Uh, okay, that's a, that's, wow, that's a lot. All right, so I it's really interesting. I write how I read. So all my in my my reading pile consists of anywhere between twelve and twenty books. So. My, <laughs> the plan is most likely what will happen is over the next five years, there'll be a, a release of like 10 books <laughs> because wow. Wow. That's, how, that's how I write. I have, I have a contemporary fiction novel I'm working on. That's about 35,000. I have um, a um, sort of Dungeons and Dragon-ish epic fantasy I'm working on. That's about 30 as well um, and a few other small projects in there. In addition to this six book series, which I've just am in the editing process of, of, of the second novella. So that, like I said, that'll be out mm, end of summer, beginning of fall. Um, and I'm okay. fine with that. I mean, a lot of people say, well, Vince, you know, why don't you just focus on one and bang it out? I, I, I can't do it. I, I've tried to, to like just be obsessive about the one thing. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to stress myself. I write when how do, I, how do you rotate from what writing don't you get things mixed up in your head if you're working on seven or eight things at the same time do you uh, strangely enough no um, and that that's I'm not mm -hmm. sure how I cultivated that odd skill but it seems to work I do have to make sure I go back and read at least one or two chapters like if I'm going full throttle on one thing for like a couple months and then I, I've set that down and I let that percolate and I switch over here. I have to go back and read a little bit to get my head back in that headspace. But mm -hmm. I like that. That's enjoyable to me. Um, That's fascinating, Vince. I, you're the only writer, I think, that has ever said that they do that, that I've ever heard. heard. That's fascinating. I, there, there, well, I guess, yeah, there might be some people out there that have never <laughs> said that or don't want to admit that, that, they, <laughs> that, right. they're, all, that they're all over the place <laughs> with their writing. But that's, I think that's, that is how it'll shape up over the next four to five years. I just going to be this onslaught of books from me, whether you like it or not. So, yeah, it's and fun. By the way, uh, link, links to uh, Vince's uh, Amazon page and his homepage and uh, Legends of Tabletop, all in the description, guys. Again, oh, links yeah. are in the description. Oh, but, yeah, Legends of Tabletop. I'm more of a silent partner with that. I mean, I do a few things on the back end. I handle the IT for that. And I do some of the interviews and set some up, set up some of the interviews and things of that nature. Uh, that was um, really the the brainchild of my uh, my friend and uh, business partner John Haremza. He we were he and I were talking one day, and he's he's really into gaming as well. We both have role playing backgrounds, and he was thinking about doing a blog, just sort of like, hey, you know, I want to I want to do some writing. I like games, and maybe I'll just you know pick up a game, I'll review it, and I'll do a little WordPress. Then I'm like, no, 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 no. If you're going to do this, do it. We're going to go set up a website. We'll, we'll you know, get a logo. We'll do a whole the domain name, and we'll just we'll make it a brand. And then it took off from there. So we do – we've done a few author roundtables as well, artists, uh, game designers, Kickstarters for different games, uh, things of that nature. And they're all live streams, and we transfer them to MP3 downloads and of that nature. And we have – a few people that 
contribute and do content for us as well. But you can check that out at legendsoftabletop.com. But we've just recently incorporated LLC, um, and that's going to allow us to work on a few uh, legitimate projects and push those forward. So that's that's also in the works. So it takes up time as well. So. All right, excellent. TJ, what have you got in the works? What's uh, going on? What do you want? Uh, uh, and if there's anything that you want people who are you know listening now or are going to be listening to this as it's when it's archived to know about you and uh, your work, you know what else you got going on? I know, I know you, I know the short stories. You can talk about that. And go ahead. Yeah, I'm. Uh, people can want to see more of my work and go to tjmartinell.com. Um, I also do writing um, as a volunteer. Uh, researcher with a constitutional think tank called the 10th Amendment Center. So if you guys are interested in guns and the Second Amendment, um, I'm Absolutely. your man. So you can check out uh, my archive on my on my website. Um, yeah, I'm trying to do more short stories just because it's faster, easier to write and fits people's attention span. Uh, and the current theme that I've been going with is just looking at the corporate censorship that's going on right now and taking it, it to its uh, inevitable conclusion and seeing what that would look like in a, in our society. And then I'm trying to finish the prequel to, to the stringers. Um, that one's a little bit longer than the other ones, so it's going to take me a bit of time to go through it. I wrote I wrote the draft, the the initial draft years ago, and I just need to go through it. Okay, um, Anne. Uh, I, I guess I'm uh, also committing the sin of being a little bit all over the place right now. Like I said, uh, later this summer I'm going to release the second of two novellas in my Electra's Revenge slash Life science fiction series. I'm also working on the book I was talking about, about uh, for a, a group of friends whose friends keep dying young. It's called Mike is Dead. Um, and then I'm, I'm also, I don't know how long it's gonna take me to write this, but I'm, I'm sort of picking away at, I guess you could call it a memoir, but it's based around a theme. I. As, as those of you who have heard my interviews with John Steele before know, I have collected an unbelievable menagerie of liars and lunatics throughout my life. I just, just due to being too patient or too curious or too stupid, I've let just a parade of crazy people and liars into my life. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of writing an entertaining or would be entertaining I, know, I won't take this personally, Ann. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering, I, I'm assuming I fall into the lunatic character. <laughs> Actually, since neither of you have ever tried to kill me, you're probably not going to be in the book. But <laughs> Not that you know of. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, that's going to be called Lunatics and Liars, and it's just a chronological exploration of all the crazy people I've attracted in my life because I was I was having a, a conversation with a fan about some of the crazy shit that's happened to me and he kind of stopped me in the middle of a, a of an anecdote and said you know I don't know how you do it halfway through that story I would have had a gun in my mouth <laughs> and, and I realized most people she realized that she doesn't own one but if she did <laughs> I realized, wow, I guess most people's lives aren't like this. Maybe I should write this down. So I'm, I'm writing that down, A, for entertainment value, and B, to maybe try and figure out why I attract a constant menagerie of lunatics and liars and maybe exercise that a bit. So, are you going to name names, Anne, or are you going to <laughs> use pseudonyms for these people? I'm Just thinking wondering. of naming names. Um, I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> you think I might get sued? Consult the lawyer first. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I, I I do have libel insurance, but maybe. What do you What do you What do you, what do you guys? Think, I don't think it's. I I don't think that. I don't know if it's advisable to name. I'm not saying that it's that's necessarily advisable to name names, but I don't think it's going to be. It would be a legal problem if you create a character who had a name, who had certain things in common with a real person who had that same name i don't i mean i'm i'm not a legal scholar but i don't see i don't see how that's a possible uh legal problem for any for uh, in any way i mean that's just my impression 
but it might still be a good idea to to disguise their name to call them something else besides what they're really called. Yeah, it might save me a few legal fees if I just change the names to not protect the the the, the, the crazy. Well, I, I can say this: I'll be looking forward to reading that. I I, I want to be someone who gets uh, the draft copy. <laughs> um, that, that'll be fun. I, I, you know, I think I got a feeling I might know or indirectly know some of these people, so that might be that might be a really fun read for me. Oh yeah, well, you know, you you know some of these people, but as I started thinking about this idea, I realized, like, basically since I was born, like I've run into, like you'll you'll be surprised by some of these people. Like, you know, I've I've thought about every year of my life in chronological order. I'm like, oh yeah, she was crazy too. Oh. He's a pathological liar. Where where do I find all these people? And a lot of the stories are really entertaining, but it kind of makes me stop and think about, like, is is that a thing that novelists do? We just have too much like curiosity killed the cat sort of thing going on, or is this just something pathological with me that I just like to sit there and observe crazy people until they actually start to damage my life? Anyone want to take that question? <laughs> I'm not going to touch it. I thought it was a rhetorical question, so <laughs> just, just ponder it. Okay. Well, when I when I get a hold of a real lunatic, like I know I should step away, but I have to sit there and watch. Like kind of like a car accident, you got to just yeah, <laughs> yeah, like kind of like a car accident. Like I've I've had roommates who were just utter train wrecks, and if it's a roommate, it's not that easy to walk away from because you're on a lease with them, but still it's like you can't take your eyes away. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I understand the fascination aspect of it, certainly. Yeah, but I mean, also though, I'd advise you, Anne, to, you know, maybe work on your boundaries a little bit, you know, in, in the psychological sense and, you know, protect yourself and insulate yourself from that, you know. True. I mean, God knows I've experienced my share of dysfunctional people, but I try to, you know, the older I've gotten, the more in control of my life I've, I've gotten, and the, the the I'd like to think the more mature my psychological boundaries have become. Right. Well, when when you when you start to realize that this isn't normal to be surrounded by crazy people, that's the first step to not being surrounded by crazy people. Yeah, identifying the problem, right? Right. But this is not the uh, psychoanalyze an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't want that hour. Up actually. next, <laughs> that'll cost you. Yeah, I, I charge. I charge real money for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, anyway, so Anne, is there any so last things you want to say about your your work? Your um, uh, you, you, you would you didn't never sent me your links because you were sick and whatever. So, so I just put down your your um, the link to your homepage and I'm assuming from your homepage your your, your personal website anstersinger.com which is in the description that from there they can find links to everything else all your works and everything like that and I also I wanted to ask you Anne I don't know if this is true or you at any available time but you used to freelance as an editor are you are you doing that at all do you want to yeah yeah I'm 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 actually working with the safety doc right now um, I, I freelance oh great yeah, yeah I know no, but he's, yeah, he's in the chat. His, his book is awesome by the way um, okay and how do you how do I say his last name? David, how do you pronounce his last name? Well, I used to know how to pronounce his last name, so you were freaking out over how you didn't know how to pronounce it, and now I've <laughs> forgotten. All right, so did just just David <laughs> today. All right, I just I just call him the good doctor. Okay, Andy. Last but certainly not least, let us know what oh. what what are you working on? What's going on? Certainly not least, um, I'm. See, this has been a. a a kind of eclectic time for me writing wise. I haven't written fiction in a while. Um, I, I've been working on this series called Ruminations of a Low Status Male. And I, I uh, wrote volumes one, two, and three of that. And I've sort of been uh, a little bit working on volume four, but I've, I've, I'm not sure if there is enough in me for a volume four. So that might just have to take uh, some other form, you know, like maybe, maybe just a, a few articles uh, sprinkled here and there at various sites, and that'll that'll uh, take care of that. But as far as fiction goes, I, um, like I said, I've had a difficult time writing fiction, but I'm trying to get, or lately, but I've, I'm trying to get work my way back to it, and uh, I actually 
had been like a couple of years ago, I had been working on a sequel to my novel Heart Killer uh, that that's tentatively titled The Invisible Twins. Um, Heart Killer, for those of you who, those few of you I'm sure who haven't read it, uh, is a, uh, has a kind of science fiction element to it in that it... Uh, time travel. Yeah, there's time travel and there's also the creation of a parallel world. Um, through uh, And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, that particular genre of sci-fi. I have been for a while, not, not time travel, but... Uh, I mean, I was into time travel when I was a kid, but um, but I've, uh, See, I see you. Andy made me go back getting into time because I remember reading Heart Killer several years ago, and I was like, man, this would be so cool if I could do that. I don't want to give give it away because, to be honest, the time tra- another thing about that book, the time travel shit, Andy, that came out of nowhere. Like you're reading the book, yeah. you have no idea that this time travel thing is going to happen. And, yeah. Well, I mean, you kind of did the tease with the uh, FBI agent trying to recollect this, and she's all whacked out because, you know, her brain can't comprehend it, so you know something. But you have no idea it's going to be like this time travel thing. And then the guy time travels back, and and the way you recreated that, that, uh, you know, you took me right back to high school, you know, with the members-only jackets and everything. I mean, it was great. (laughs) Well, thanks. Um, I love love your work, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. That, That's that's pretty nice of you to say. so the the uh, what I've been what I'm working on now what I've been working on what I was working on a couple of years ago before I, I kind of got sidetracked was the sequel um, and uh, it goes under the tentative name the Invisible Twins and it's set in this alternate world that that gets uh, spun out by the actions of the main character he goes back in in Heart Killer he goes back in time and changes certain things and that changes the course of history and so. So this book, The Indivisible Twins, is set in that other, uh, that that other that alternate history, um, which, as I said, that's the that's the kind of sci-fi or 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 SF. I guess I'm told if you know people who are really into science fiction don't say sci-fi. that's what all the kids are calling it. <laughs> but um, so uh, it, it's set in this alternate uh, world where 9/11 never happened, and. Uh, so it's it's kind of yeah and, and yeah it's interesting to to sort of circle back to that uh, to, to to the subject of nine eleven given what you revealed earlier in our conversation about your friends um, and uh, so lately nine eleven has become kind of a the the muse for me that that Columbine was uh, for me back when I was working on the Columbine Pilgrim I don't know what it is about you know incredibly tragic uh, um, events where a, a ton of people die uh, or are really badly injured, at least, that's, uh, that, that is muse material for me. I mean, I'm not sure what that says about me. but Well, I, I, think, I don't think that's too complicated. I wouldn't read too much in that. I just think it, because they're so emotionally impactful, and ultimately I think that's the beauty of fiction. The reason I like to read good fiction is it, it brings, you know, it invokes an emotion out of you. And, and any, any yeah. art form that's done well, even a painting, that is really good should uh, you know um, create an emotion should an emotional experience same with a great film and yeah. um, th- well that's right. anyway that's my thoughts I, that's why I read I don't know why you guys read maybe well, you guys read fiction well that's what you do but readers mm-hmm. I'm not I'm a reader and I'm not a writer I read because I want um, it's not just simple escapism it's because I want to I, I want to feel some emotions man you know and find out right. something. Yeah, and if, well, I mean, yeah, I read nonfiction too. I read a lot of. Um, right. I, I enjoy reading, actually, of all things. I actually enjoy reading um, autobiographies of all things. I don't probably most people. Oh, yeah. Shit, but I actually enjoy those. Um, as long, you know, I'll never read like a bullshit one like that's ghostwritten, like Hillary Clinton's or anything like that. But the other people who've had really interesting lives, it's it's fun to read their autobiographies yeah. slash memoirs. So actually, the so Anne's thing will be really fun when it comes out because I'm going to be all over that. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that might be, that'll be a show, Ann. That'll be a show. I don't know if it'll be. I don't know if will be able to air it, but it'll certainly be a show. Um, but so, just, go ahead, Andy. Well, I was just going to say. So I, I eventually, since it was taking so so long, and again, inspiration is not for is for me now not what it used to be. Um, uh, I ended up publishing the first segment of the Invisible Twins. Uh, on uh, just on Kindle, 
So it's actually available for uh, I think a dollar ninety nine. So if anybody, uh, if anybody's interested, um, it, but it's it's also the sequel to Heart Killer, so it, it's, it might be. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'll, I'll buy that as soon as I get offline. Oh boy, well, appreciate it. Um, and uh, it, it's it's a kind of a, a complicated, circuitous uh, a story about a, a parallel universe and. A lot of what's what's involved is is bound up in my my uh, take on the, the event of what the significance of 9/11, the uh, what uh, what we're told it's all about, and what I think actually happened. And uh, I don't want to get too sidetracked. Yeah, don't get away. Otherwise, we'll yeah, no, 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 I won't. I won't. I won't. But uh, that's that's what's part of what's bound up in uh, in. Uh, 9-11 functioning as a muse for this, this story. So so that's a work in progress, but it's very, very slow progress. right? Now. And I'm assuming you're going to continue with uh, your uh, nonfiction commentaries and uh, your, your, your YouTube in a car, as I call them? Yeah, I, I started doing, uh, I started with my YouTube channel almost a year ago, and, and uh, it's been something that I've had a lot of fun with. And I, and, uh, well, I mean, I've had fun with, and, and that's also been useful for me, but I, I'm trying to, you know, scale it back a little or try to balance it with some of the other things that I'm doing and also what I'm trying to do to just to keep my head above water, uh, you know, as far as uh, making a living goes. So, so um, you know, it's always a, it's a constant uh, uh, balancing act. Yes, it is. So um, I'm going to have to end it here. Is there, well, but I, before we go, is there anyone that feels there's something they really they really uh, want to get out there? Or I, I didn't I give you. I stepped on you and give you a chance to to say it. I just like to know why you uh, what what your because you contacted me and you contacted all four of us, I suppose, in the same sort of way. Like, hey, you want to do this podcast? And I was like, sure. But what uh, what was it about? Uh, about the four of us that you particularly wanted to, and, and about fiction writing that you that really struck your fancy that you wanted to have a conversation with us well part of it was um i we a lot of us share um all you're all fiction writers but at the same time you all share mutual acquaintance we all have mutual acquaintanceships slash friendships with people hmm. So, um, and also, um, uh, three of the four of you i've interviewed you uh one-on-one -on -one. And I plan, if, if Dennis will be so kind, I plan on doing a one-on-one -on -one interview with him as well. Um, so it was it was kind of a way where, okay, I was like, well, I've interviewed I've interviewed these people one-on-one, -on -one, but they would have like to get them all together and see how that goes on. So it was kind of an experiment. I just I wanted to see how this would go, and you know, I, I kind of thought it would be fun. So it, it, basically, it was for my mm -hmm. own enjoyment. Although I got to be honest, it was kind of stressful setting this up. You know, I mean, Anne is. And is on life support right now. We didn't know if she was going to pop in and trying to get your own <laughs> time zones. And, and uh, you know, it was stressful. And, you know, it was, I didn't know uh, how the chemistry would work with the five of us together, you know, all this kind of stuff. So, to be honest, it was stressful. But I'm, in gl I'm so glad I did it. And I'm so thankful for all of you coming on and, and being so generous with your time. We're gone here like uh, over an hour and 40 minutes since uh, you got on. And I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been fun. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, so I just want to say to our audience, uh, those who uh, were in the chat. Oh, Aaron Cleary just popped in. Okay. Hey, buddy. <laughs> you, you missed the damn show, Aaron. You'll have to wait till it, mm -hmm. wait till it uh, goes in. Um, uh, wait, hold on. I got another way. Uh, Oswald Spengler's asking. I got, uh, oh, this is a good question that we should, we should go out on. And uh, we'll start with Vince on this one. Uh, he says, can you ask the guests their favorite work well, or works of fiction? But let's try to keep it, well, to one or two. Otherwise, you might be here all night. So, uh, Vince, first. I got my love of fantasy and, and sci-fi from reading Lord of the Rings. So, J.R.R. Tolkien. Okay. Uh, TJ. Um, torn between the Starship Troopers and All the Pretty Horses. Mm -hmm. huh. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting combo. Yeah. <laughs> the duality of uh, fiction. Uh, Anne. I keep coming back to William Makepeace Thackeray's Vanity Fair. Mm. Uh -huh. Social satire. 
Andy. And don't say the wrong word. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I hate to be really basic bitch, but but I, I really, really love The Great Gatsby by uh, uh, um, Fitzgerald. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I forgot who wrote it. <laughs> 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 but I would I would also say Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, mm. uh, Hamlet by Shakespeare, yeah. um, and uh, uh, Notes from Underground by Dostoevsky. Nice. Okay. Well, I'll, well, is anyone interested in what one of some of my favorites are? Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, it's anime. Uh, uh, Hamlet is, is one of them. And interesting enough, I'm not a huge Shakespeare fan. I'm one of the few people who didn't like Macbeth, uh, but I loved Hamlet. Oh. Um, mm. Novels I loved. Uh, another one that another one I know Andy loved. Fight Club. I think that was uh, the, I, guess, I that was kind of like yeah. I thought. I think it was total Gen X fiction. Uh, loved that novel. One of the few people who read the novel before the book came. Uh, read the novel before the movie came out. Um, thought it was. I actually thought the novel was superior to the film. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because people say that. But, uh, it's not just Gen X fiction. It's men's fiction too. It's men's fiction, modern, but it was modern it was, men's fiction. Yeah, it, it matters and. Um, Let's. Uh, other, um, I also loved, uh, and this is unusual for me because I'm not a huge short story guy at all. I love Dubliners by James Joyce, specifically the novella at the end, The Dead. I think that, that was, was a great book. I, yeah, I love the, I love uh, Dubliners too. It's yeah, wonderful. I just thought that was, and it's not just because he's Irish. I thought that uh, that was that was great. Um, that there's some there's some of the you know I, I memorized several quotes from uh, The Dead. And I got to tell you, uh, those have gotten me laid so many times. Uh, <laughs> I so, knew that was coming. <laughs> just, you know, if you're not into, you know, great fiction, guys, just read it for the, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, social benefits. But anyway, to those listening, uh, do me a favor. Please hit the subscribe button. That really helps me out. Um, and at the very least, hit the damn like button. Um, Seriously. And uh, once again, I want to thank you all so much for doing this. And who knows, maybe we'll do it again. Um, and uh, that's it, guys. Good night and take care.